Barry Moser is a printmaker, illustrator, book designer, wood engraver, book right, booksmith. <laughs> Welcome to the Bibliophile. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to be in here talking to you. What's the difference between a book right and a booksmith? <laughs> None. Um, I, I've never been comfortable with any term for what I do. And so I, I made up the word booksmith uh, as unto a blacksmith. And then one day I'm walking, driving along behind a truck, a black pickup truck with a beautiful signage on the tailgate that said somebody's name, uh, John Muller, Barnwright. And that triggered the second name. So I, I, I made up the term book right, right because that better actually describes what I do than booksmith. So I, they're both words that, uh, what are they called, nonce words that I made up. Yeah. Yeah. But no difference between the two. Okay. Book right is simply somebody who operates in all of the fields of the book. All of the book arts. That's correct. Except paper making. I don't know how to make paper. I now I know how to do it, but I don't do it. Don't know how to do it personally. And I don't cast type and I don't design type. So I guess you can see that I'm a part an almost entire book right. Okay. A partial book right. A partial book right. Maybe we could uh, you could just describe to me then when we say printmaker. What do you specifically? What do you do? Well, printmaking, as opposed to um, illustration, I think that might be your question. Illustration can be done with pretty much any medium, but printmaking is limited to the media that produce multiples of the image. It's an interesting uh, concept to me. And there's a book coming out, and I wish I could tell you the man's name. He's a retired scholar from Yale, and he's doing a book on Renaissance woodcuts. But it's not the woodcuts, it's not the prints, it's the blocks themselves. And he and I had lunch uh, one day, and we were talking about this because it's one of the things that I find both interesting and perturbing in a way is that the object that I actually make that a printmaker makes, whether it be an engraved block, a woodcut block, a lithograph, an etching, or a copper engraving, they're all in, the object that's made is not the art object. The art object is what they, what they yield when impressed into a piece of paper with ink, yeah. onto a piece of paper. So that's the big distinction. Now, illustrations can be etchings, wood engravings, woodcuts, or any of the above. Illustrations in a book can be any media, drawings or whatever, but printmaking, the, 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 the images are all in multiples, and that right. can be anywhere from five to, or less even, or you could go up to, maybe you could get up to 500 and still call it a limited edition. Beyond 500, it, it's no longer a limited edition. That is, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of other people, too. So when you go into a store and you see a, a you know a Norman Rockwell, I'm not I'm not disparaging Norman Rockwell, but if you were going to a store and you see something that advertised uh, as a limited edition by Norman Rockwell and the edition's fifteen hundred, well it's bullshit. I mean on several accounts, good Norman Rockwell never made a print in his life, and uh, the fifteen hundred disavows anything of being limited. So with the uh, wood engraving, for example. You take the the end end grain, uh -huh. end grain, and then the first thing you start off with is what you do a drawing on it on the block. Uh -huh. So it seems to me that the the first talent that you really re require for any of this is the ability to draw. Absolutely. If you can't draw, then the rest is. Uh, in my book and in your book, that's probably true, but I know an off I've had students who have made some really beautiful prints who couldn't draw for diddly squat. Um, I can get them over that hump often right. and tell them, because in, in my way of thinking, I was trained in college 
uh, as an abstract painter. So my underpinnings are all in non-objectivity. Mm. Uh, even to this day, uh, the project I'm working on right now, the first step in making those images was to take a brush the size of your hand and throw an enormous, big, bold, black streak across the paper with nothing intended except energy. And then into those great big splashes, I'm thinking, you, you might think here of Franz Klein's work, okay. or of, an, of a small child with a big brush and black ink. Within that mark, I will, f I will figure my images and bring all of those out. So someone could make a really beautiful print by simply dashing a big brush of, of black uh, ink onto a lithographic plate and then mm -hmm. printing that. It's the definition of drawing that I kind of get hung up on there. It, yeah, like there's representative and non-representative. Non exactly. And so you could do non-representational images without the ability to draw a figure, let's yeah. say. But if one chooses to do figurative illustrations, if one can't draw well, then, then it, you're in trouble, it, right? You're in trouble, yeah. yeah because yeah. then you end up doing very amateurish kinds of work. You like to quote Clive Bell. I have many times, yeah. Yeah, yeah. who uh, suggested that the subject is irrelevant. It, yeah, how does that go? Um, subject matter in art may or may not be helpful, but always it is irrelevant. Yeah, I've always liked that phrase. And, and it's true, because I mean, I'm, I'm working on something that's highly figurative. I'm engraving it. The block is upside down as much as it is right side up. Right. I'm no longer paying really close attention to, to my subject matter. Now, that's sort of a lie, because if I'm engraving a face, when I come to engraving certain features, especially if it's a portrait, I have to pay attention to the details. But if I'm doing a figure... Uh, and in the case that what I'm working on today is, is an image of a lynching, uh, when I get to the figures of the three lynched men, I have to really pay attention to the figure itself. But the background behind them, if I lose the, the ropes, no matter, I don't care. Right. Uh, what I care about is the, the verticality of the images, of, of the image of mm. the three figures hanging that I'm concerned about is that that vertical feeling, not so much the rope from which they're hanging. If I'm making myself clear, I'm not sure. The idea that these guys are there's weight there and that they're yes. hanging and they're dead. Yes, and it's vertical. The emphasis is on those elements, which I hope then influence the reader's interpretation of that image. Right. They get the sense of that the weight of hanging. Yeah. You don't hang horizontally. You hang that, this, so that's that vertical. But all of the images in the book are vertical. I have a lot of choice of whether to emphasize the verticality or not. Yeah. Now, here's your philosophy of art. You're looking for a balance between opposites. Yeah. Light and dark, sad, happy, simple, complex. Yes. Open, closed space, black, white. All of that. Perhaps you could expand on that a bit. Well, uh, the idea of opposition is at work and I believe in almost everything. One of the illustrations that I use for my students when I'm teaching drawing is that I ask who, anybody sail in this class? And somebody inevitably knows how to sail. So I take the student who knows how to sail and the student who doesn't. Okay, you have a boat. You want to make it into a sailboat. You erect a mast and you put a sail on it. Well, if you don't do anything to the mast, it, it, it's not going to stay still. It's going to fall. So you have to put a line to the bow. Well, if you only put the line to the bow, the mast is going to flop left and right and forward. So you have to counter that with the opposite line to the stern. But now it'll flop left and right. So you have to put up a, guy, a, a line to the mast from the starboard side and another one from the port side. That gives that mast its stability. It's the same thing it's with anatomy. Bicep brings the forearm up, tricep brings it back. If you didn't have the opposing forces of that, the arm would be immobile. So I think that that principle is inherent in everything, uh, at least everything that I know about. You know, every action has an opposite 
reaction. So it's a it's, it's a principle like of the, physics as well. There's good and bad in everyone, for exactly. example. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, when I'm drawing, I want my blacks to be opposed by and stabilized by the whites, unless the black is part of the essence of the image I'm trying to go for. Got a commission years ago to do a, a portrait of a wolf for the jacket of a some business magazine. It was an article with something about the chief financial officer. And so I did the, the face of a growling wolf with glaring eyes. Uh, and it was all black except for that wolf. So the black enhances the horror, as it were, of this snarling animal. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always looking for that. Uh, in fact, Nick Basbane one time commented or asked me the question, so you're always looking for the darkness where other people are looking for the right light, and you're looking for a light where people are. And I said, yes, that's exactly right. So when I'm doing Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, instead of migrating over to you know the, the, the John Tenniel-esque images, but when I came to it and I read it, I read a different story. And I wanted to go in that direction. I didn't do Alice as a book for children. It's very much a, a book for adults. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's sort of always going on in my head. And I like to, when I'm reading literature, I, I, if I'm reading very serious poetry, uh, I like to turn then uh, and balance that out with reading uh, Andrew Hudgens. Uh, he wrote a really wonderful, funny, funny little book of poetry called Shut Up, You're Fine. And uh, so it's always that balance, you know. I think most great art, great literature, uh, incorporates what you've talked about yeah, this yeah. this sort of tension and this trying to accommodate both in in the yeah. in the work yeah, yeah. You, you can't write a novel or a play and have it constantly constantly beating at you with horror and misfortune without mm. taking a moment here or there to laugh well speaking of contradiction you were a, as a young man you were a lay minister with the Methodist Church, but at the same time, you were raised a racist. Yeah, that's true. That's an interesting uh, combination. Yeah, it is. Uh, in the American South, it's not, though. That's pretty common. Yeah. It's quite common. And we see it today. We see it in the politics of America today. You were born and raised in Tennessee. Tennessee, yeah, yeah. Chattanooga. Yeah, I wasn't a lay minister. I was actually a licensed minister. So, it, it, yeah, I held, I, and my license to preach is hanging on the wall in my office at Smith. Okay. <laughs> and right next to it, there's Your bona fides, a, right? <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> right next to it is a is a is a, an engraved a little motto that was engraved by Leo Wyatt. It says, "God will not judge us by our medals and diplomas, but by our scars." And I have that surrounded with medals and diplomas. <laughs> Where are your scars? I, I, well, I don't bring attention to it, but when I find a student or somebody visiting, taking a look at that wall full of crap, I say, you can't look at that shit unless you look at that. You have to read that first to understand why this is. That's not self-aggrandizement up there, boys and girls. That's to point, make a point. These diplomas and all that, don't, they don't cut it as far as I'm concerned. I'm not very happy with so with adulation, and I, I don't like it. I, was, I had a lunch with one of my best friends today. I tell him talking to her about the, the upcoming interview. And I say, you know, it, it, it sometimes makes me uncomfortable because for this man who I do not know is going to travel from Montreal to come to talk to me. Why? I mean, what have I ever done? In my mind, the question is, what have I ever done that would it, <laughs> that you? That, that this interviewer from from Canada is going to come down and talk to me. I mean, yeah. it's I have a, I have I have trouble there, and I just lost my thought. Well, you recognize. I mean, you're recognized around the world as a, as a you're accomplished in your field, and you've been recognized. Yeah, I understand. Uh, at the top levels, so that's yeah, that's I an know, obvious reason a, for that, me. But uh, but mostly, I'm just interested in the fact that if you can accomplish this, you must have some really interesting things to say about books, and that's what I'm interested in. Well, I, I think I do, and part of that religious, that early religious life of mine, uh, which was relatively short-lived, it only lasted about three or four years, and then I became an 
deeply religious agnostic. I'm a scared agnostic. A big part? I'm a scared agnostic. <laughs> May I steal that from you? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but some of the first books I ever bought were books on religion. And the first book I bought is in the other room where I keep my, my truly rare books. And it's not a rare book at all. It's only rare to me. It's the teachings of Flavius, the writings and teachings of Flavius Josephus, who was a Jewish theologian, a Jewish historian at the time of Christ. I've never read it, but I've had it for 50 something years. And I wouldn't part with it for anything. But that was the beginning of my library. So why do you, I, what, what's so important about this one? Well, nothing except it's the first book I ever owned. Then why'd you buy it in the first place? Because it mentioned Jesus. Oh, okay. I think there's only one one place in it where it mentions Jesus, but that was enough for me to buy the book. And mm -hmm. I probably paid three dollars for it, you know, mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. But it was the beginning, it was the foundation stone of, of my my library, though I didn't know it at the time. But that was as I say, that was that was the the, the first stone that went down mm -hmm. to build this up. And so the other thing, too, that I find, you know, I wrote a memoir a few years, but it published in 15. Mm -hmm. And there's a part what's, of it. What's that, that called? Uh, we Were Brothers. Mm -hmm. It's mostly um, a memoir that deep, deals with uh, a, a very difficult relationship I have with my brother. But it does touch on all of these other things. Um, not much in depth, but yeah, I was, when I was a preacher, I walked into this real preacher, uh, walking in his office in his home. I was trying to seek advice about where to go to uh, seminary, that sort of thing. So I walked in, and his wife ushered me into his into his study, and it was a room maybe half the size of this library with a quarter of the books that are, if that, in, in his study. And I think it was the first time I'd ever seen a wall full of books in a private residence. And I became very envious of that. So I started it, collecting yeah. books because, and I'm deeply sincere about what I'm about to say. I started collecting books when I was 19, 18, 19, because having books around me made me feel like I was smarter than I really was. I spent six years in a military school from age 11 to 17. And in those six years, I was constantly berated for being stupid, ignorant, a moron, an idiot. Um, it was constant. And <laughs> to everybody, basically, but I was one of the, They wanted to break you, I guess. In a sense, it, it's domination. I think probably everybody went through that just like I did, but some didn't pay any attention to that. I paid attention, and I really came away from that feeling like I was substandard intellectually. Right. So the acquiring of, doubt, of books around me yeah. started, I think, was at first some sort of, of, of an elixir that would maybe cure me of that, would make me just by some Protect you. process of, of osmosis, I was going to gain knowledge. So those are, that, that's the foundation of my beginning to collect books. Mm. You know, I just didn't read books. I was, I was slightly as, as dyslexic when I was younger. And I think that's self-diagnosis. Because I, I read things backwards. I read things backwards and I started learning how to set type. Yeah, that kind of helps you, doesn't it? It sure as hell did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Harry Duncan. No wonder you're so good at what you do. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Harry Duncan said one time that the most uh, is typesetting is the most God is, is the most difficult form of reading there is. It's upside down and backwards. Mm -hmm. And when I started learning to set type, I started to read. I mean, that's just that's a historic thing. I, I mean, in my personal history, I just I started learning how to set type. And I started reading books. And you really absorb it when you do oh, that my too, don't God. you? Like yeah. you go letter by letter. I mean, you're it's, yes. You really I was talking do. to, to uh, head of the English department, well, former head of it, Smith, the other day, and uh, I told him that that I read word for word, and he says, mm. "So do I." Slowly, it takes a long time to read yeah. Moby Dick, <laughs> but when you read it, you, you by God have read it. So, 
Yeah. I'd like to sort of touch on some of these bigger issues, and then we can uh, talk about some of the specific sure. books that you've sure. worked on, if, sure. You're, sure. if you're okay with that. Uh, music is your religion. Is that yep. true? It's fair to say. So you left Jesus and you moved to music? <laughs> Not exactly in that order. Okay. Music has always been with me. Um, it's the religion that I've never left and never will. As a nine-year-old boy, I love to build model airplanes, model anything for that matter. And I love to draw, as all nine-year-olds do. Uh, and on Saturdays, Saturday afternoon, I would be sitting in my bedroom building a model or drawing pictures and listening to the Saturday afternoon opera. At, at age, age nine. nine or ten, somewhere in that neighborhood. Hmm. Yeah, kind of a strange kid. But I played football and all the other stuff. That's a so well-rounded maybe, young man. Yeah, well, in military school, that's sort of the goal, right? In a way, except drawing was not encouraged. In fact, I got my ass whipped more than once for being caught drawing. I don't know whether it was for the act of drawing or because I was always drawing naked women. <laughs> but I got disciplined a lot of times for drawing. No wonder you went into the private press. Like <laughs> naked women and private presses. There's a pretty strong connection there. Yeah, and I think Eric Gill started all of it. Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, that was my beginning with music, and even in high school, mm. I was listening to the the, the great uh, Broadway musicals, you know, Carousel and all of that. Mm. And, and you liked it all, yeah, the a pretty lot of Catholic. It. Uh, but I, yeah, I did. I started off with a pretty Catholic taste, but I couldn't quite grasp Bach at that time. So Bach wasn't big on my lane. He's like at the head of the heap right now yeah. in my life. Um, so my musical taste evolved and matured over time. Okay. I mean, when you pulled up today, the reason I didn't hear you pull up in the driveway mm. uh, because I was listening to uh, 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 Pert. Uh, oh, yes, Arvo. Arvo. Pert. Yeah. I love his music. Me too. Yeah. And I didn't hear you pull up because the music was turned up too loud. <laughs> I listen to music all the time. And uh, what I said, what you quoted me as saying, is actually my quoting, I believe I'm writing this, and quoting John Updike. I think Updike said that long before me, that if it weren't for music, I'd be an atheist. Yeah, I feel a real deep kinship with music. Pretty much all kinds. I used to hate country western music. Yeah. And it's because I grew up with it, I think. Sure. Yeah. And it didn't quite comport with the Saturday afternoon opera. But in my latter years, I became a big fan of Willie Nelson, Shania Twain and you know, a whole bunch of people. I like the old country music, you know. I guess that's what I like. I, I, I love it. And then I discovered mm -hmm. a few years ago the the, uh, the music, and I watched me not get the name, um, Tiabati, ah, Tiabati. I'll let it go at that. Yeah. An uh, African uh, chora player. Never knew what a chora was. And then I heard this, this, incredibly beautiful, strange music. And it was he, and my wife had discovered him, and so we started listening to the music and the chora music. And I fell in love with the chora. Do you know the chora? I'm sorry, I'm not. Don't know that I do. I mean, I might, if it's I heard it, I might. Pardon? It's a gourd. Oh, and yes, okay. And they come in many sizes. Right. And one of them has as many as 20, 21 strings on it. And the right. player has to play it between his feet to get the frets up here, you know. Anyway, so, yeah, I I have very curious. My musical tastes are inquisitive. Uh, there are certain things I, I, I don't know how to listen to. I've never learned how to listen to jazz. I mean, I love what I, sometimes I'll be coming home and there's a, our local uh, NPR station has a jazz program in the evening. And if I'm out and coming home, uh, I will listen to whatever they're playing. And I've heard some jazz that I really, really like. Mm -hmm. But some of the other, uh, I don't know, leaves me feeling stupid or disinterested or yeah. both. You talk about the rules of composition being the same for poetry and music and images. I believe that's true. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. Um, but to flip over to your field of images. Yeah. It, making an image 
is, as I said earlier, it really doesn't have anything to do with subject matter. So it's the pulling together of the disparate elements that make up images, which is light and dark, color if color is used, uh, rhythms, uh, repetition, uh, emphasis. Uh, these are all principles of design. And the unexpected element, that's one of my favorites. And I think that if, if I'm not a novelist, but I do write, and I know that when I'm composing an essay, I'm looking for those same principles, yeah. the opposites, all of these things that work together to make that, that, that unit. And I've got a lot of writer friends. I have a lot of poet friends and a few music friends. Uh, and we all, we're all in concert about that idea, although none of us actually practice all of those things. I don't write poetry. I don't have the temerity uh, nor the knowledge to write poetry. Mm. I love poetry. I love beautiful poetry. And I wouldn't sully the profession by offering whatever I might have to offer. Well, I think you might want to do it on your own and not show it to anyone. <laughs> that could but, be too. Yeah. So you were trained as a painter, <clears throat> but you had an affinity for woodcuts. Mm -hmm. And Leonard Baskin, I suppose, would you say that he... Uh, cultivated that oh in you? Oh my God, yeah, yeah. Can you talk uh, about Leonard Baskin? Well, <laughs> we don't have time. Um, <laughs> I was at Auburn University in Alabama, and I think it was 1959. I was in the library. I always loved libraries, curiously enough. Being not a very good student, I've always been attracted to libraries. So anyway, I was in the library in the art department, and uh, I was reading some magazine. You know, art. It wasn't art in America, but it could have been something like that. And I turned a page, and there's this, this spread, and, and on the on the left was a page of of writing, of calligraphy, and I didn't know it at the time, but since then I've seen the article. So it, I might call it a tortured italic, beautiful, but not the really formal thing. On the recto was this tondo, this round image, and it just took my breath away. I looked at it, looked it up, and, you know, found out who did it, and it was Leonard Baskin, and the title of the print was The Death of the Laureate. And there's a very nice impression of it hanging in yon room. That turned my life around. That started, image. That image. And then huh. I started following him, trying to find an article. Of course, it was long, long, long before Google or any of that. So to actually follow somebody, you had to be reading and looking at magazines and whatever. And I developed, I started to file on him, all the articles I could find and all that, you know, from Newsweek and Life. And, and then I moved north, and I moved to East Hampton, Massachusetts. That was around 67, was it? 67, exactly, okay. yeah, August. And the only thing I knew about the area I was moving to, really, uh, being a old southern boy and never having been to New England before, was that Leonard Baskin lived in Northampton and that that was adjacent, immediately adjacent. And so the first thing I did when I got here was to look up his name in the phone book. I never told him that because Leonard didn't like to be adulated. Just like you. Oh, he, no, no, different from me in that he loved it, but he would not let you do it without him. Mean, he, if you sucked up to him, you were on his bad side. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Yeah. So you so didn't anyway, suck up to him then, or did you? I did, and that was a big mistake. Okay. So we get here, and I look up his name in the phone book, and I don't even know the word, no idea, no inkling that I would ever know him. You know, the great man, the, the yeah. man who in my opinion was nearing, you know, godlike status. And I'm a shit kicker from Tennessee, and the chances of ever eating meet him, yeah. Well, a year later, I had met him and was, I mean, within a year. I had met him and was, quote, studying, unquote. With How'd him. you meet him then? There was a guy in Northampton, uh, Louis Smith, to whom I owe a great debt, uh, who was a good friend of his. They did a couple of books together. Uh, Louis was a glazer and an art supply dealer and a collector, a collector of prints and uh, some exquisite stuff by Katie Kolovitz and Rembrandt and all the biggies. Anyway. So Louis had befriended me because I went to his shop to buy materials. And so he, at this point, what were you doing? I was teaching at Williston, a, 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 an all-boys school in East Hampton, and making drawings and, and trying to learn how to make wood engravings on my own. 
my first wife had bought me some tools and some proper wood, and, but I was just butchering really nice Turkish boxwood, unfortunately. So Louis, uh, was ta he took an answer to my way. I said he wanted to see some of my work. I went in, I showed it to him. His comment was, uh, you're pretty good, but you need some coaching. Who would you like to study with? And uh, so I just hemmed and hauled, and I said, how about Baskin? And he said, sure, let's go. And that, on that, in that very moment, now Louis was a, a big, uh, big guy, uh, Russian Jewish uh, heritage, and uh, sort of the typical uh, stereotype of a New York Jew. If you, I mean, big, you know, overabundant personality, and a cigar always in his mouth. <laughs> and he drove a Bentley. Oh no! Yeah, so that would stick out, wouldn't it? <laughs> So we went, he said, let's go. So we got in his Bentley and drove over to Baskin's studio. And uh, we walked in. Baskin was working on one of his big wooden dead men. And uh, I, it's an image I'll never forget because it was dark. It was big spotlights. And What is were, this, wooden dead men? Wooden dead men. Big sculptures. Besides that table. Re reclining dead men uh, carved in enormous blocks of wood. Anyway, he's chipping, cutting away on that thing, and uh, there were wood motes in the air, filtering through the, the spotlights. And he turned, and, and it, it, it was either Vivaldi or Bach that was playing. I don't know which. I don't remember that well. And I got a little dumbstruck. And I walked in, and he looked up, and he says, uh, we were introduced. And then he said to me, well, what do you want to study? In a very gruff unfriendly voice and I said drawing and he said uh, reluctantly well all right well meet me at Smith uh, in the studio uh, next week or whatever it was and I showed up probably shaking <laughs> because when I walked into the, it was, the art building was being constructed at that time the new art building so he was off off into another building someplace in the basement and I walk in, and he's, he's sitting down, and he, he was trying to get the cap off of a, a, a tin of uh, etching ground. He couldn't do it, and he handed it to me. He said, here, you look like a strong boy. Get this off for me. It wasn't a question. It was an instruction. Do this. And um, I didn't even take the can in my hand, and I said, I, I, I won't be able to. He said, why not? And I said, because my hands are sweaty. He said, why is that? And I said, big because I'm with you. And that did not impress him. But because Louis Smith was leaning on him, uh, he did not curtail my studies. Now, my studies with Leonard Baskin consisted of this. That day he said, do you have something around you that you care a lot for? And I said, only my family. And he said, well, then I want you to draw a tree and I want you to go I want you to buy the smallest pinpoint you can find, and I want you to buy a sheet of really good drawing paper, and I want you to draw a tree, and I want to see every goddamn thing there is on that tree. That was the assignment. So I went away. I made a drawing. I took it back to him. I made a very small drawing, a very big piece of paper, and that was the first thing he said, why the hell did you make such a small drawing on such a large piece of paper? And I said, I don't know, Mr. Baskin. That's the sort of thing that I talked to my students about. He said, well, go do it again. And I went and did it again. And I brought the third drawing, the second drawing to him. He said, go do it again. Didn't even criticize it. He just looked at it for a minute. He said, go do it again. Third drawing, same thing. Fourth drawing, same thing. Five, same thing. Six, same thing. No words of, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? And then finally, I had a drawing. Sounds like boot camp. Yeah, phew, yeah. except he, he wasn't hanging over me all the time. So I t get to drawing number, whatever it was, and I'm really, really proud of that drawing. So I took to Louis Smith to see. I you wanted know, his opinion first, and while I was there, Baskin walks in. So I show him that drawing, and he looked at it for quite a spell. And then he looked at me, and he said, well, I'd buy that drawing. And then there was a pause, and he said, now let me ask you a question. Who did that drawing? You or me? 
and it was an interesting question. It still is, in my mind, an interesting You wouldn't question. have done it without him. Exactly. Yes, it was me who did it, but you pulled it out of me. So, yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing. And that's a story that I, I don't usually tell the story at length to my students, but I do do the same thing. You know, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. I work for you. I'm your employee. You don't work for me. So this is your class, not my class. But you have to pull it out of me. What's the, what's the most important lesson that he taught you? Tenacity. Hold so on to what? it. Uh, Keep on doing it until you do it as well as you possibly can do it. And don't accept things until exactly. you think they're perfect or it, close to it. And that's a never-ending task. Yeah, yeah. And that's the big lesson is that it will never, ever be good enough. If yeah. it ever is good enough, then I will descend into the ranks of, of, you know, the, I don't mean to demean anyone, but, you know, like Hallmark cards. You just, you just do something that people love and buy, and then you just keep on doing the same shit over and over and over yeah. and over. Well, it sounds like you're an explorer, or, uh, you know, with music, for example. And so, I mean, you're not you're not going to sit on your laurels. Exactly. You're, you're always... I mean, you've done 400-odd books, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, when my wife left me three years ago, which was really um, traumatic for me, and in fact, it was the year that, that my memoir came out from Algonquin Books in Chapel Hill, and she had been instrumental in getting it on the desk of an editor there because of her, she being a bookseller, her book rep from Algonquin, a workman, took it from her and gave it to an editor he knew. And so we skipped the agent thing mm. altogether. So that was all in there. And then she up and pow, leaves me. So I was traumatized. And that summer, mm. I did, because I had a, a 75th birthday anniversary celebration as a one-man show in a gallery in Northampton, my main gallery. And... I did not want to show old work. And so what I did was, I don't even remember how many now, but a whole bunch, 25, 30 big abstract drawings. I just wanted to get back to where I had been once before in my life. And it was both, here we go again, it was both a joy and a torture. This was after she left? Yeah. The very summer she left. She left right. in July. Right. And I was doing these drawings in uh, in August and September, getting ready for an October opening. Yeah. So yeah, I love to explore with things. And I, it's I find if I find myself getting in a rut, which I have quite a few times, I will intentionally do something as close to opposite as I can, without losing the thread that goes through those four hundred books that you mentioned. The thread being. The thread being me, the, the, my presence in the images. And I guess what I mean by that is that they're images that can't be attributed to anyone else. No, that's right. They're very recognizable. Yeah, now. But by, when I was studying with Baskin, they were not. They could have been confused and often were confused. Mm. You know, Moser obviously studied with Baskin up until the time that it was no longer obvious. And, of course, Baskin mm. taught me to draw like him in those 10 mm. drawings without saying a fucking word to me about it. He <laughs> taught me to draw like him, which is natural. My students draw like me. Until they... Until they find their own legs. Mm. Yeah, exactly. He had his own press, the Jenna Press. The Gehenna Press, yep. Gehenna three, Press. Three syllables. It's a Hebrew word for an area outside of, of ancient Jerusalem where they burn the garbage. It's also uh, been said to be uh, another word for death, which I'm sure is why Leonard might have. <laughs> yeah, the Gehenna Press produced some incredibly beautiful books. Like, which is your favorite? Which is uh, the best? Flosculi Sententiarum. I'm going to be really impressed if you know that one. Uh, the Flosculi are the printer's flowers the ornaments, uh, and the sententiarum are the quotations, the aphorisms, Spanish, French, English, Italian, you know, all the short little quiffs of things. But they're surrounded with a page of ornaments. 
and ornaments are not easily handled and they are particularly difficult to do beautifully and to do well. And Baskin was a master of it. How come they're so hard to do? It's a good question. Partly because people will overdo them. And you, one could make an argument looking at the Floskili that he overdid that. But he didn't. It, and there's that fine line between going, it's like Flannery O'Connor said, uh, fall short or go beyond. It, it, he, he didn't do either. You know, he, he, he fit right into that space and did it so beautifully, it did take my breath away. And these are printer's ornaments, Little you say? Ornaments. Uh, you know, you see them all the time on bindings and uh, the, the flowers, arabesques, as they're called, because they come from originally from the Arabian decorations, that, like the, the Alhambra. Yeah. Things like that, yeah. And this is a book full of those. Yeah. Page after page after page. I used to own a copy bound in citron leather. Beautiful thing. How come you don't anymore? No, some son of a bitch stole it. And I think I know who it was. But he's dead and I can't do anything about it. But I did put a, uh, whatever you call those things, when you put a, a rider on somebody's will, that before things are disseminated, I have to have a look. And I did, but it wasn't there. Hmm. So I think he probably stole it and then sold it. And he was yeah. a Roman Catholic priest. Mm. Now, there's a study for you. Yeah. You might, if you've ever heard of Father William Fletcher, Father William Fletcher was a Catholic priest, and man, he had a sticky finger. He was <laughs> well known for stealing things, but nobody could ever prove it. I was in <laughs> London with him one time, and we were visiting various bookstores. He actually was well-connected. He introduced me to an awful lot of the folks that were connected with the Ditchling uh, group of Eric Gill and all of them. Mm. I met his daughter, Joanna. There's a tight face named after yeah. her. Yeah, I, I had dinner at her house, actually, mm. with, with Father William Fletcher because he knew all these people. So we're in London. We're staying over in, in, in Whitehall at a nice hotel, and he went off. Uh, we went to a bookstore together, and i get got so many stories in my head, I can't keep them straight right now. But at any rate, he, if we gathered cocktails you know, around 5 o'clock, and... Uh, he was showing me what he had found in this one bookstore. And he had found a, a Eric Gill title, and he bought it. hadn't really looked at it, he told me. And he was sitting there at the table with me. We are outside. And he said, oh, my goodness, look at this. And inside the book was a postal card addressed to Eric Gill's son, it was a postcard that Eric Gill had written to his son f from London, and I, somehow or another he had been to the London Zoo and made his son a drawing of a lion, I think it was, that just happened to be stuck into this book. <laughs> As I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> Father William. You lucky, lucky man. Yeah. <laughs> he had all kinds of things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Came across a stone that a Hopton Wood stone that Eric Gill had had cut. It was in the basement of a bookstore, and he bought it. And then he bought a, a, an airplane ticket for it to sit on the seat next to him. And I don't know how. I don't think he could steal something that large, but I'm sure he came about it. He used that collar. He always went book shopping with his collar on. No, yeah. But yeah. when we traveled in the countryside, he didn't. Yeah. So yeah, I got to I got to meet all sorts of people. We spent the night at Ampleforth College, which is where one of the Eric Gill's partners' son played the organ. Spent the night in a Benedictine monastery. That was a trip too. I divert. I, I, I just, uh, yeah. I, I digress. digress. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You established your own press, the Penny Royal mm -hmm. Press. When was that? Late sixties. That would have been in nineteen seventy. Nineteen seventy. Uh, the first book we print, I printed, was not under that imprint. So it came to the second one, which was in nineteen seventy. I didn't know what I was doing, but I learned. Well, Baskin was whipping you into shape. No, not Baskin. Not Baskin at all. Baskin never gave me the time of day after those ten drawings, except to say hello, and then did that begrudgingly. No, I, the, the, the one who whipped me in shape was Harold McGrath. 
who was Leonard's um, president. Yeah. One of the greatest printers to ever draw breath. And, what made him so great? Oh, I did, he just had a touch. Whatever he printed, here's an example. Baskin was producing, Gehenna Press was, was publishing a bibliography of the work of Thomas Bird Mosier. Oh. No Ken. Different spelling and all that. No, no, he's the he's he had his own publishing house yeah, yeah, in yeah, Maine, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. guy. Yeah, Mosher. And if I'd had any sense when I began my press, I would not have called it Penny Roll Press. I would have I would have bled into that and called it the Moser Press. Yeah. That would have been a much smarter thing to do, but I was young and stupid. I didn't know what I was doing. It's, so Baskin's printing a bibliography of his work, and they're printing an eight-page form. So there are eight pages on the press. It's 12-point type. Now, mind you, I'm making some of this up. I don't even remember. It was 12-point. It could have been, you know, something else but very small type. And then after that page, that form had been printed, um, the, his editor, Sidney Kaplan, was somehow, why not? Why he didn't, why he was reading to then proofread? I don't know, but he did. He was proofreading the sheet. It found an error. And the error was that there was a comma where there was supposed to be a semicolon. So Huge McGrath, error. And this is a press twice the size of that table. Big mm -hmm. press. Yeah. He locked up a 12-point period in that press and struck it over the comma in perfect registration. Oof. So need I say more? Mm -hmm. uh, he had, and I don't know anybody who can control that kind of registration. And Alice, for instance, there's a page where Lewis Carroll tells us that there is this little elixir, this little bottle, had a label on it that was beautifully printed. I couldn't let that go by, you know, as a topographer. Mm. So I actually designed the page so that I could put the bottle, the engraving of the bottle, toward the, the right-hand margin. And then in the margin, we printed the label okay. in six colors. And it really is a beautiful little, little tiny bit of printing, but it's really beautiful. So McGrath did most of your printing? Uh, yes. Mm. Up to the Bible. He did the Bible? No. No. He okay. was he was getting he had brain cancer. Oh. He didn't know it. Or I guess maybe he did know, but he wouldn't tell anybody. Right. But he was making making some really serious mistakes. He, some people thought it was he was just getting careless. But and he was, was, but it wasn't intentional. And yeah. it wasn't that he didn't know better. He was sick. He was sick. But he did print the extra suite of prints for me. So printing the, the, the engravings, I've never had anybody print them like he did. I do now. One of his students, uh, Art Larson, has a shop over here in Hadley. And he is, I think he will be, when he hits about, boo, I guess he already is 50. Yeah, he's coming into his own. He can hold a candle now. But I've never seen him do that that kind of registration. But anyway, so McGrath was the one that kept pushing me. By, pushing you how? By learning more about how books are made, uh, how to design a book for the printing press. He, yes, because because we've got the, the Penny Royal, but you're also doing now, you're doing illustrations for trade publishers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. And I don't know when it started, but... If you're going to do the illustrations, it became part of the deal that you were going to design the whole book. Right. Is that Was that always? You, you weren't no. always be able to say that. No, 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 no. You had to take the illustration uh, contract first, and then you got to a point where you could then make that yes. demand. And then it was, it was actually never a demand. Um, it was a request, a strongly held request. Right. Because if you let me design the book, I can then work the typography and the images together rather than giving you images that you stick into a book someone else has designed and they're not necessarily integral mm. and they're not necessarily organic to it. They don't, they might, you could pull them apart and not have anything lost on either score. Okay. Whereas if I design a book as I, and illustrate it, you can't really pull the illustrations out and have them go into another book, mm -hmm. nor can you take the typography 
you know, yeah, they're, it's, they're, it's a, you, they're wedded. It's an organic whole. Exactly. They okay. hold together. That's, yeah, it's like my Bible. Um, there's no way. Let's to, talk about the Bible then. It's the Penny Royal Penny Caxton, Caxton Bible. Bible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 looked, I had a, a nice uh, browse through it up in Montreal at the McGill Rare Book Library. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they yeah. got a copy. That was printed by another very fine printer out in Texas. Uh, so there are really good printers around who can do the job. But uh, you couldn't take the Pinero Caxton Bible and produce it in another language. It's impossible because of the difference in lengths of lines in English mm. as opposed mm -hmm. to French yeah, or yeah. Spanish or anything else. And the, the illustrations are fitted. I would make an illustration that I didn't even want or never had occurred to me to do in the Bible just so I could drive the type down on a page to make the page end the way I wanted it to end. You know, I, I, an image of a sailing ship on the Mediterranean or something that I didn't care two hoots about. But I used it to take the type to, f to another page so that the chapter would end where I wanted the chapter to end. You know, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff is calisthenics, typographic calisthenics. And that was the sort of thing that Harold McGrath taught me. And, and how to design, because he, he, I designed something, he said, for Christ's sakes, Moses, God damn it. If you were to make this thing another pike wide, then we could do this and we could do that. So it was that kind of thing that he would kick my ass about. And it was through that process that I learned how to space type and how to space pages and place them on a page. You did too. 267? Something like that. Uh, More than actually, over 300. But only 267, if that's the correct number, and I believe yeah. it is, the only, that's the ones that made it in the book. And then there were a few that made it into the, the Penarol Caxton Bible that did not make it into the Viking trade edition. Um, I swapped them out. There were a couple that I, I, looking at them a while later, I just didn't like. So mm -hmm. I, if it's going to go out to 50,000 people instead of 50 you know, people, mm -hmm. I, I, wanted, I wanted the opportunity to change it, so I changed some things. You make you make the point that art and money are pretty closely tied. Yeah, and you had a patron for this Bible. Oh my God! Yes, 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 yes. And uh, he put up something like two million bucks. That's right. Yeah, and lost half of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, his name's in there somewhere, isn't it? So he's oh yeah, <laughs> and he's also I, I, I use him as my my model for. Uh, Jesus Christ, Moses, come on. The great wise king. Solomon, yeah. Yeah, he's my model for Solomon. I just pulled this off the shelf here. I've got this as well. This is what David is Godin's. Uh, oh, Godin, yeah. This uh, medieval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, he mentions this in, uh, in, the, in the conversation I, I had. I haven't seen that It's here. quite lovely. It really is. Most it's, of his uh, books are. Yeah. yeah, there you go. This is Baskin. I mean, this is Baskin's influence. Influence, oh, yeah. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, How can you tell that? I don't know. It's just you, your you just experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is very, very definitely. See, this was 1971. See, this was one of his one of his early books. Yeah, no, exactly, yeah. And this is Cancelloresca Bastarda, the only person I ever knew or ever have known that had Cancelloresca Bastarda was Baskin. Oh. And one of the most beautiful typefaces ever designed. It's a Van Krimpen okay. typeface. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's very much. Yeah, it's very Leonardy. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice book. But this is one of his first books. Yes, that's why I got it. Yeah, because um, that's 1971, so 4,000 copies would cost a French Creedle. Yeah, Mackenzie and Harris. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the Deo Gratius at the end, that's, that's very Leonard-like. Yeah. yeah. But my books are Leonard-like. I mean, yeah. it, it, that's, the, that's the influence of, of, of a great man, a great, well, he's not so much a great man, but he was a hell of a fine artist, a great typographer. So getting back to the Bible, would you, uh, or do you even, venture forth with opinions on what your greatest work is is that i mean is that what you're proudest of having yeah. done yeah. quite by a long shot yeah 
But I'm of uh, I'm also of the mind of Brahms. Somebody asked Brahms, and this might be apocryphal, but uh, it probably works. Is. it works though. It's it's, it's a good one. Anyway. <laughs> Someone asked Brahms, um, "What is what is the your favorite of all of your works?" Yeah, and he said, "What I'm working on at the present time," and I think that's largely true. But if I step back. And forget what I'm working on. I have to, of course, I have to say that. I mean, it, just in the scale of the thing yeah. in itself. Well, it's also, uh, you You were the first person to do actually all of the uh, images in in the Bible since Doré. Yeah, that's, that's right. what has been said. And the thing is, there is, it's a little tricky, but that is true. Now, Mark Chagall did an entire set of etchings uh, for the Tanakh, for the, for the Jewish Old Testament. They were never bound into a book form in his lifetime. Salvador Dali, of course, did the Biblia Sacra, but he did he did lithographs and pretty shitty ones at that. While he was in, I don't know where he was, somewhere in Spain or whatever. But the book was published in Paris and printed in Paris, so the lithographs came from up there to down here. And again, I might ha- not have this story correct. I'm, I'm not a historian, but. At any rate, the, the illustrations were done here. The book was printed here. The illustrations were then stuck into that book. And any time an image is stuck into a book, it pisses me off. Well, it doesn't piss me off. It just makes me say, that's not an illustrated book. That's a book that has pictures stuck into it. It's like a scrapbook. It doesn't have any more integrity right. than that, as far Be- as I'm concerned. Because there wasn't thought put into the text and the image exactly. together. And then he did... I don't know the numbers, but he did something like 25 illustrations for the Old Testament and 25 for the New Testament. Uh, excuse me, Salvador, yeah. that don't quite cut it. Yeah, I think my book is the first one that all of the books of the Old and New Testament, sans the Apocrypha, were done by the same person. I'd also read that your Frankenstein was your favorite, though. So what what's that about? Well, you did the, typographically speaking, it is. And it's also one of Godin's favorites of mine. I think he now owns one, but he was really passionate about finding one. And he included it in his choice of the century, yeah. century books of the century. Um, typographically, it's pretty pure. And uh, it's that the purity of the typography that I'm what, so fond of. What does that mean? Uh, good question. Uh, all of the other books that I've done, you have indentations on the paragraphs. Not in that book. What I did was to use a pill crow, a little, little yeah. uh, broad-footed cross in between paragraphs, which Michael, Bex- Michael Bixler set the type for that book. And when I told him what I wanted him to do, <laughs> I mean, I was setting him a really difficult task because if you if you leave a word out in your composition, uh, you've got nowhere to back up to. You have to go all the way to the end of the chapter okay. to pick something up. It's right. really, really tough. But on the page, you have this glorious rectangle of uniform color, page after page after page. No interruptions of anything. And that, I just, I fawn over it. It's, it's, for me, that's sort of a purity of abstraction. Uh, Joseph Albers just came to mind, you know, the, the, the great colorist down at Yale. It's just one, one rectangle inside another. And the relationship between the two, yeah, that's, it's, it, people, and that's the invisibility of it. You didn't, nobody sees that unless you're in, yeah. the, in, the, in the business of it. Yeah. That's what makes things beautiful, part of what makes things beautiful. Yeah, so but no. In terms of, of the of the the depth and well, depth and breadth, yeah, the Bible has to rank up there at the top. Because it, another thing is too is that I mean, the Frankenstein was done under our own systems of financing. If I had had the same kind of structure with Frankenstein, God only knows what I would have produced. And that's where the 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 the, the, uh, the marriage of money and and art come in into play yeah i mean it's a it, it's a myth as i'm sure you know it's a, it's a myth that artists are all starving tubercular uh, denizens <laughs> of, of addicts i mean it, it's it's just 
it's not the case. I mean, Jesus Christ, I mean, who was it? Raphael lived in a palace. Rembrandt lived pretty well, too. Yeah. Until he didn't. Until he, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's all a myth. Uh, yeah, I could not have done the Bible. The Bible that I did, I could not have done for less money. When, I, when people hear that that book cost $2 million to produce, and there are only 400 of them, it comes out to $5,000 a piece. And I said, yeah, well, uh, it has to do with the same principles of architecture. I mean, you can go out here and buy a, a single wide for 15, 16, tw under $20,000. And it provides you with shelter, very small kitchen, a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to spend $2 million you know, instead of $17,000, you'll have something a lot more comfortable, a lot bigger, and there are a hell of a lot of better work that goes into it and materials and it's the same principle what the 20 what the two million dollar book has is full vellum bindings uh all hand sewn and there are a lot of signatures to sew the paper that was made for us in germany you know all these things mm -hmm. uh, and each one of them costs money Fortunate. well it's the best of everything it's the best of everything yeah yeah he never said no to anything I asked. Mm -hmm. and when we did it, I gave him, he asked me first off, uh, he said, what do you, I don't want to go too far into this just for time's sake and your purposes, but I met him at an, at an exhibit that I had in the old Gotham Book Mart in, in Manhattan. Yeah, so when I'm up there, I'd, I'd done a, 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 a Truman Capote thing mm. and the watercolors were on exhibit. There's this big guy come in and introduces himself. He's a collector of the Penner Old Books. And um, early, because I mean, he was one of the first ones to buy an Alice. And, that sort of and um, we just got chatting. He's a guy that stands at full head taller than I, and he's got a, a sh shirt very much like yours, with the same alligator thing, you know. It yeah. was light blue. <laughs> and he was there with his wife, very sweet, pretty woman. And we just started shooting the shit, and he said, um, so is there some project you want to do but you haven't done it? Yeah, and I said, yeah, I want to do a Bible sometime. This would have been 19, oh, way back in the 80s. And he said, why, didn't, why haven't you done it? I said, well, I ain't got enough money to do it, you know, first. And then Harold McGrath's getting older. He, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, if you ever change your mind, let me know. And I forgot that story until my business manager reminded me of it. So I called him, and uh, he said right off, he said, well, I was sitting on the, on the commode upstairs and when I went and took the call. <clears throat> and um, he said, well, in principle, I agree to be the bank for this project. And uh, he said, but what kind of money are we talking about? And I said, I think we could do it in and out for about, I don't remember what I told him, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of half a million. I don't even think it was that much. Probably closer to a quarter of a million. And uh, he said, well, that's not a problem. He said, that's, uh, not, he said but I, I want us to have a budget. We'll stay within the budget. doesn't mean that we can't change the budget. So that was the way we went into this. And then I've redesigned the book, fully designed it. I had to do a preliminary design to get an idea of how much the paper costs were going to be. But the paper costs, as I figured, they were on commercially available papers and all that. And so then, because he's a big time book collector. I mean, he owns two copies of the Dove's Bible, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So, I mean, a huge collector. I mean, he buys books in the $150,000 range, you know, mm -hmm. and upward. He's one of the richest guys in the United States. One of the hundred richest, yeah. Yeah. So he says, um, well, that's not a problem. We want to change things. And every time I ask him to change something, he was sure. So he just changed the budget. I was out in Indiana. I was visiting with uh, Howard, and, uh, well, I was out there to do a lecture at Purdue, and I was having lunch with uh, Catherine and Howard Clark, Twin Rocker Paper Mills. Catherine asked me, she said, well, how many of these Bibles are you going to print on handmade paper? And I said, it's not in the budget, so none. And she said, well, that's a shame. What if we print, make enough paper for you to print three? One for Bruce and one for you. What's his name again, Bruce? Bruce Kovner, K-O-V-N-E-R. And none of this is in, in any way uh, secretive. I mean, it's public knowledge. He's not a very public man. And see, there's another story, but never mind. Um, 
See, that's the problem with me. I have so many stories going in my head. I lose the track of one because I want to pick up on another one. Where was he? So I yeah, you were was, sitting down with this woman from yeah, Indiana. Yeah, from the paper. Yeah. You know, and I, just, so, I said, well, I don't know. Uh, let me ask Bruce what he thinks about it. So I call him up. I say, hey, listen, they want to make paper for us to do th three Bibles on handmade paper. I just want to know what your thoughts on that. Was. And he said, oh, my God. He said, I think that's a great idea. Except I think we ought to print 50. So immediately the cost of our project went up about $150,000. Wow. In the blink of an eye. It's a pretty good banker to have. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, and in the very beginning, I said, okay, you're going to be sinking all this money in there. Do you want to have any say in this project? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're a man of taste, and he knows books. And he said, no, 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 no. That's good. He said, I just want to sit back and watch you do it. So I, ha I had the life for a period of four and a half years. I had the life of a sort of a renaissance yeah. artist being a, having, a, having a patron. That's right. And I got my money every month. And unfortunately, I never, in my figuring out of the budget, I did not put into my retainer anything withhold with withheld from taxes oh, right. so at the end of every year i got sucked with a real big tax bill so well, the story speaking of the bible just goes on and on and on and on it's mm -hmm. a huge story yeah. well it's a huge accomplishment i mean it's a it's it an absolutely beautiful book i think it's right over there yeah just your left yeah. hand yeah. yeah well speaking of book collectors yes just uh, winding down here, perhaps what we could do is have just have you go through some of the highlights of the, uh, the Penny Royal and then of the trade books that you've done. Let's say, you know, this is a this collector who doesn't have much money, but he loves your work. So how would that person go about acquiring a good collection of books that represent your life's work? I don't know. I'm not a... Ooh, I was about to tell a big one at that. I said, I'm not a collector. And I'm just looking at <laughs> thousands said, of books here. Said, yeah. But they're all signed first editions. <laughs> and you're not a collector. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm an acquirer. Okay. <laughs> uh, as opposed to a, a collector. Right. I don't know. I mean, if I were wanting to begin a collection, if I were outside of this, and I wanted to to do this my personal approach would be first to go to abe yeah no i know that, that i don't i'm talking about the actual titles themselves though like oh, oh the oh. books that you think are you Seminal know the, to that well that that would the, yeah that would represent your work well but that wouldn't cost the bomb for the yeah. for the this person to well it's to that collect. latter part that gives me a pause because i don't know you man, don't know how much they're worth or exactly, how much they I have no idea but, um, but, I mean, there must be a lot of trade books that are oh, not that expensive, right? Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, do any come to mind that maybe early stuff? Like, for example, the first oh. book that you illustrated was The Flowering Plants of Massachusetts. Yep. That, that might be that a would fun be a book good one. to have. Absolutely. And, and it was published by the University of Massachusetts, right? Correctly. Uh, correct, yes. And. Yeah. It is, it, I've seen just recently copies of it going on Abe and other places. I've seen it going from anywhere from $10 to 1500 The same book? Same book. That's well, the 1500 one has either a, a, a remark on the title page, some, a little drawing I did, oh, okay. or it has a, 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 one of the original illustrations tipped into it. Something uh -huh. like that. So it's, it's a lot more special. It might have sure. even been rebound or something like that. I see. Okay. So there are titles of that that are all over the, all but, over the uh, map. But that's a good thing because yeah. because a collector without a ton of money you can get yeah. one of these. Yeah. yeah. I would certainly seek out um, uh, Alice, but that today, the trade edition of Alice is going up to $500, $600, mm. depending on condition. Yeah, that's that's like real estate, uh, location, location, location. Exactly. It's yeah, condition. and whether or not it's signed and, and all yeah. that business. But Alice is the pe uh, is the trade version trade of the Penny of Royal. Paxton. Yes, the, exactly. Facsimile reproduction. I see. Yeah, yeah. I would certainly think that uh, the Moby Dick I did is seminal, though it's not a Penny Royal Press collection. That's the Arian Press. The the University of California Press edition, which is the Arian Press. Okay, the Arian Press did it for 
did it first, and then the University of California published the trade. Possibly. That is seminal because it what? It, it put opened you, it up put the, you on the map. Yeah, put open up the whole world to me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And what year was that? 1970, 75, 78. Okay. Somewhere in there. Funny so, how I had a hard time. You know how to get that date? I had to go back to an old girlfriend. <laughs> Well, that's a pretty good way to measure your yeah, well, life. She was, she that's was, a good way of... She was at the uh, California <laughs> College of Arts and Crafts okay. in Oakland. Right. And I got an invitation to come to San Francisco. I was going to San Francisco. And then I got an invitation to go to this cocktail party. And it was at the cocktail party I met Andrew Hoyer. So anyway, uh, we don't need to go there. Um, then after that, Frankenstein. There's a trade version of that? A trade version of that. And, and uh, that's and, University of California, too. Okay. And Huckleberry Finn, which is also University of California. Okay. And Huck Finn, because the Pinero Press did it, uh, but in collaboration with the University of California and the Mark Twain papers, because that edition is the first time Mark Twain ever appeared as Mark Twain wrote it, according to the scholarship through the Mark Twain uh, the papers. text, The text, the text is, uh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Editors, typesetters, everybody had monkeyed around with his text. So you got the the authentic, the authentic original one. first, yeah. This and it was for the centenary, okay, 1985. Okay. So right. University of California did that. That's a good one. And of course, the Pinero Caxton Bible is available from in a price range from thirty five dollars in paperback up to. Are you kidding? One hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars, something. Like that. The trade book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It came out. It came on the market at sixty dollars. Who published that? That was Viking. And you're it. happy with the reproductions in that? And everything? yeah, yeah, I was. Now the overall collaboration with Viking, uh, not so much. Okay, but that's but, that, but they, yeah, the collector doesn't have to worry about that. Yeah, well, they, I think they screwed us over. As you publishers keep, will do. You want if, you, you want to keep that in there, or are you okay I with it? I don't care. Okay, good. What are they going to do, Sue? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else? Well, there are children's books. If, if yeah. you wanted to go into that thing, then that, well, I would think that any of the 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 uh, jump books, which are the tells uh, retellings of the Bear Rabbit stories, uh -huh. that was my first. And Jump itself is the first children's book I did. They have a jump, jump again and jump on over. So those are the three jump books. And who published those? That was done by um, Harcourt Brace. Okay. I think the, her first one was Harcourt Brace Jovanovich, and then the second one might have been, I don't know, Harcourt Brace changed their name yeah. so many times. Yeah. Okay. So those for sure. What about uh, Ephemera from Penny Royal? Is there any of that or not? There's a lot of that around, yeah. And I have... Um, fair collection. I can't say I have a complete collection. No. I'm a pack rat, but I don't keep up with things. Yeah. And I'm also of a, of, a, of a highly generous nature. I give things away. If someone expresses an interest in something, I will give it to them. I couldn't even put together a complete collection of my books. Just finally, I've noticed with your work, it's quite distinctive. You use thin, slightly separated lines. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could talk about the, the distinctiveness of, of that and your work in general and sure. how, how, what your thinking is behind that. Well, part of it goes back to Harold McGrath and learning how to make books for the printing press. How not to make the printer do things that interfere with the fluidity of his printing. So you have the printer in mind when you're actually Absolutely. producing the the, Absolutely. the engraving. So when I cut away, if I've got a, if I've got a list, list, I haven't even read about this, but somehow there's there's some big brouhaha about an image of an egg going around the internet right now. Okay. It's the best photograph of 2018, whatever. So so I've got an image of an egg, and the image the egg is 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 engraved you know really tightly. And then it's against a black background. If I cut away uh, against a white background, if I cut away the white area of a block and I'm using a gouge or I'm using a, a router, if I don't cut it down far enough, it will show what Harold McGrath was fondly called pecker tracks, which is where the, the wood stands up a little bit and the rollers just kiss it. 
and then that prints. So you've got this this engraving of an egg, and it's pristine, and it wants to be against that absolute white. But over here, you've got six pecker tracks sticking up, the little hints of black that stick up like hairs. I have to go back to the block and clear that out. Not a big problem. It's not an issue when the printing press is next door. But if, as in printing the Bible, the blocks have got to go from here to Austin, Texas, and be printed, if mm -hmm. I don't get all of that lowered far enough, then the block's got to come back. And that's Federal Express, and that's got to, then it's got to go back. So we're spending a lot of money. So I find it instead of cutting away whites, if I rule that, which is, the, the, I guess, the proper term, at least in topography is the proper term for, for lines, and it'll do, I think, for our conversation. If I do that with parallel lines, or more or less parallel lines, then the rollers don't have a chance to go down. They're always born on the surface of the block. So the blocks are compatible and very friendly to the printing press. So your style is, is uh, partly a function of printing. Good, easy printing. Yeah, exactly. Effective printing. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah, cut out as many boulders in your way as you possibly can. Well, not the boulders. Somebody said one time when I first got married, he said, you know, the, a journey is never interrupted by the boulders that get in your way. It's the, shoe, it's the rocks that get in your shoes. Right. Some poppycock like that. But it, that just brought that to mind. And it's in a similar way, it's not the big things that get in the way. It's all these niggly little things that, you know, are bothersome, nettlesome. They, you know, you have, and you have to solve them before you can go further. So, yeah, it's, for me, it's all... In a, in a way of thinking, I can't say all art. I don't even know what art is, but all of what we call art, some of it at least, is a result of solving problems. Well, you have to you have to consider something a problem yourself first before, because that's what sort of drives you exactly. to create in in the first place. Yeah. Is there's a there, most people don't see any problems. Right. You're exactly right in that, because when I start off to do Frankenstein, I don't have to do Frankenstein. Yeah. It's a problem I set for myself. Now that I, and I set that for myself, and then we go out and raise the money to produce the book, now I'm under obligation. And now I have to solve the inherent problems within the problem. And then each one of those has problems within it that have to be solved. And ultimately, it's going to come down to my hand, an engraving tool, the block. But it's not neg a negative thing when you say when you see a problem. You, I guess, oh. you're happy when you see a problem Absolutely. because that's an opportunity to create something right. more beautiful yeah. and worthwhile yeah. and whatever. It's the constant carrot hanging out there in front of me. I'm going to go after that carrot till I die. That's what's keeping you alive, Absolutely. I'm sure. Absolutely. You're I lucky have, to have those carrots. Indeed, I'd be dead if it didn't. I've developed in the last, uh, well, for a long time, I guess, but just realized that I developed some fairly serious heart problems in the last 18 months. And, uh, and problems with my hand. I got, problem with my, I got all kinds of medical problems. But... I get up in the morning, I'm happier than a pig and shit. Because you got lots of problems? I have problems of different sorts. And I got, I got a doozy on my drawing board back there that I've been working on since last, well, about a year ago. And I get up, I love my teaching. I think I love my teaching more than anything, any other activity of my life. Well, being a parent, being a grandparent would rank highest, but outside of family, Teaching, I think, is, teaching is, I think, my real true calling. I'd rather teach than win money. And but then, it's the same thing, you won the lottery anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then there's the work, and the work is what keeps me going. I've, I've written, talked about this often, that the, the twin engines that drive my life is my family and my work. I can do without pretty much everything else, but the work is subdivided into the two big categories, and that's teaching and doing what I do. In fact, when people ask me what I do, more often than not, I respond, I'm a teacher. 
And I think that my work is also uh, a pedagogical activity. Illustrating books has always been, has always had a pedagogical side to it. It has a preaching side to it, too. So when I did my Bible, and I've written about that a lot, too, is there's this story. When I was uh, in college, my brother and I were out hunting, and we were hunting crows, and um, there was we heard a rifle shot, and we were down, and a tree had blown over, and we were down there, and we heard the shot of a rifle, and the bullet hit me, but it didn't hit my body. It hit my shirt right over here. Yeah. It went through the pocket of the jacket I had on, and I had a gun in my hand. And the bullet went through my jacket, it went through my T-shirt, made two holes in the T-shirt about that far apart and didn't touch me. So that began my religious life. When that happened, I thought, well, God must have some reason for my being. Okay. So the only thing I could think of as a 19-year-old kid was to become a preacher. Right. And then that went by the way after about five years, five years later. Um, and then the agnosticism kicked in. And then, you know, half a century later, I come to this. I come to this Bible. And making the images, I found myself preaching. The images are pedagogical. They, they're didactic in places. I hope they don't show to be that, but they are. I'm trying to make a point. My Jesus has no halo around him. That's right. You're making, a, there's the text, but you're making another point. And in fact, that, that's a good thing to end on, I think, is what you talk I about. I thought we were going to end on Andrew Hoy. <laughs> I thought we were going to, well, I, I do want to go there. What's fine by me? I do want to go there, actually. I, well, I, I wasn't going to, but I, but I do want to. Do you have the time? I do. Yeah, here we are. Okay. Uh, you're talking about wanting to make a pedagogical point or, yes. a, or yeah. another point that's yeah. not the point of the text. Exactly. So a, a bad illustration is one... It contradicts the text. They don't... Yeah, they don't deepen the text, right. as you okay. say, yep. or uh, take it in a new direction. Right. It, it's just plonked there. Right. It, do, it doesn't do anything. It's, it's a decoration. But, and that brings us, that, that's actually not a bad way to get into Hoyam. You, I mean, perhaps, I don't know, I'm just speculating, but he probably expected you to, to illustrate the text in a traditional way that sort of showed whatever the text was saying. You wanted to do something about the whaling industry. Totally backwards. Totally backwards. But isn't that how it came out, that it's about the whaling industry? Yes, it did. And I think it was a brilliant idea, but it was his idea, not mine. And that is, I think, one of the reasons why you don't see my name on the title page as the illustrator. My name occurs in the Ryan Press Moby Dick once, and that's in the colophon. And it comes, I believe, in third place, not even in first place. And comes, wait a minute, you've done how many illustrations for it? Exactly a hundred. Yeah, and no mention. Andrew and I didn't get along. Uh, we, we, had, uh, we had our problems, and I will leave that there. I won't go further into that. Well, you're both strong-minded, obviously. Uh, yeah, and some of us are uh, better humored drunks than, than the other. I said I'd leave it. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, but it, it is safe to say that Andrew and I are not particularly fond of each other. Uh, but no, it was his idea, and to this day when I talk publicly or privately about Moby Dick, I disavow being the illustrator of that book, because I didn't illustrate it. I executed the engravings. He told me everything to do. Yeah, well, I, that, now, that's, was, that's the first problem right there. Everything, and I don't qualify that. He told me everything to do. I had no choice in anything. The only latitude that he ever cut me was on that full page image of the big whale. And I had to jump through so many hoops with him, sketch after sketch after, but like Baskin, he made me do that. And I was so pissed off at the time, at him, and at the project, that I would have settled for something that wasn't second rate. I would have settled for something that was fourth rate. He wouldn't let me. And he pushed me and pushed me to do that image and do it the way he 
wanted to see it, and he was right. I was wrong about that, and I'm proud of that image, but it's the only full-page image in there. He also deprived me of black, I mean, of big, big dramatic blacks, which is kind of my forte. Well, um, it's the whale, too, for crying out loud. Well, there's loud. No, no black there. You look at it, and you find very little black. You, oh, they're black lines, yes, but you don't find any big patches of mm-hmm. black. It was verboten. He didn't want the illustration. It was one of the first things he said to me. This is to be a typographic book, not an illustrated book, and the the images will never uh, overpower the type. So you kept on with it because it was such a big deal with the the Aryan press. I signed a contract. You signed a contract. If I hadn't, I would have... Couldn't you break the contract? I was too... I started to say young. Well, I guess I was. I, I was. I was just not experienced enough. I didn't know the way that my first really big book, that was, I think, the first book outside of Pinero Press I'd ever done. So I was learning my Plus way. Plus, it, it was a big deal there. I mean, there it are was great, a huge deal. There are great press. Yeah. And it, you would have got, you did get a ton of exposure. Oh, my God, yes. It made okay. my career. Or at yeah. least it gave, it didn't just kickstart it, it punted it. Despite the fact you disavow the, the images. No, I don't disavow the images. I disavow the, the subject of the images and the ultimate... Uh, I don't like using the word gestalt. Uh, somehow or another, it always seems sort of foreign, but I, it is the word I want. Uh, the, the, the gestalt of the images is not what I would do if I were inventing them on my own. I mean, the main thing was he was telling you what to do the yeah. whole time. Obviously, yes, that's going to piss you off. Yeah, and so, then halfway through it, so we, no had, wonder. we had this big falling out. And then from that point on, nothing. The second half of the project, not a single thing went between him and me before it went through lawyers. Yeah, fuck. Yeah, oh, totally fucked. I mean, yeah, anyway. Yeah, but he did. He told me pretty much everything to do, uh, and I had to do a lot of it over again. Yeah. He screwed me out of the blocks, Um I don't own the blocks. I don't even have permission to give anybody. I don't have the right to give anyone permission to produce anything out of that book, to right. reproduce anything. Right. I had a, I had a, a something up here in a um, oh, big seafaring town on the coast of Massachusetts, and they're up near Salem. What the hell is it? Great clam chowder. Anyway, um, it's, it's a park, a nautical a, a, a marine park of some sort. They yeah. wanted to do signage for the whole thing, and they wanted to do a couple of the images from Moby Dick, so they come to me to for permission. Yeah. I said, I'm sorry, I can't give it. You'd have to approach Andrew Hoyam. He turns it down. I have never forwarded anyone to him yeah. for permission that he ever gave it. Fuck. And the answer has always been, it would diminish the dignity of the book. Well, we've got, uh, we've got 400 possibilities to choose from. So, uh, just, uh, I mean, I can go over get there. out there and get out there and check out what there's, what there is and, uh, and start collecting them. Yeah. Well, I could, if you wanted to right now, I can go over there after I take another leak, I could go over there and just cite titles back to you because all of them are right there. Yeah. Well, I think we'll let the, we'll let the collectors do that themselves. Okay. Uh, but for now, yeah, uh, I, that would that would be the seminal collection right there. Beginning, I guess. What? There's nothing before Moby Dick, really. You mean so the uh, trade books out, are, outside but, of the Penny uh, Royal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because those early Penny Royal books were editions of fifty, sixty, and they were never reproduced. Yeah. So if we began with Moby Dick, and then back to the Penny Royal editions, those would be those five big, the five titles from California. Six titles from California. And again, those are... That would be Alice, Looking Glass, The Wizard of Oz, Huckleberry Finn, Frankenstein, The Divine Comedy. Yeah, those would be the, the six big ones. You did you did a Divine Comedy for... No, the Divine Penny Comedy Royal? would be like Moby Dick. But uh, that'd be through it, another... That's Who's that through? California. California as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's... Uh, that's there, a, were, there were plans, though, actually, to do... Uh, a letterpress edition of the Inferno, and in fact, the book was printed. Harold McGrath printed it, and it's in sheets in a warehouse, uh, and will never be finished. Um, it requires my 
reinventing all of those images. Some of them I already did and printed, and I don't like them, and I would not put my name to what I've done so far mm. on that edition, so it's not going to happen. I have a lot of people wanting it to happen, like Alan Mandelbaum's son, um, yeah. but it's, it's, it's like a stack of paper five feet high and beautifully printed. But no, it's not going to happen. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off. All right. Uh, I'm going to go take a leave. No, but I'm going to sign you off as um, Barry Moser, printmaker, illustrator, book designer, wood engraver, and problem solver. That's fine. I'm, I'm happy with any of that. Thanks very much for taking the time to talk. My pleasure. My pleasure.